I want the original and a nice jewel which is uh, Okay, welcome everybody to today's session in Cognitive Psychology. Today we speak about long-term memory and learning. Okay, so let's start uh, with a little bit of going back to last week's session for about short-term memory and how information is actually transferred from short-term memory to long-term memory. So, to give you just a brief reminder, so we said last week that memory stores, uh, cons or memory consists of multiple stores. So we had these sensory stores or sensory buffers, which in hold information extremely briefly and are specific for each sensory modality. Then we spoke in much detail about short-term memory, uh, which holds information in the order of seconds to minutes and has a limited capacity. We spoke about chunking, it has this number uh, 7 plus minus 2 and the word length effect that everything you can rehearse within two seconds can be sh stored in short-term memory. And today we'll speak about long-term memory which can hold information over very long periods of time and basically has a rather unlimited capacity. Okay, so how does information get into long-term memory? And referring to the models we spoke about last week, uh, we may look at the Atkinson and Schifrin model, and this multi-store model, and here it is assumed that we can store information in long-term memory only by passing the information through short-term memory. And short-term memory is conscious memory. So only information which we had consciously processed or stored in some way, at least briefly, can enter long-term memory. Cohen's model, which is a unitary store model, on the other hand, has this different concept of uh, memory where it is said that short-term memory is just the activated portion of long-term memory and here we can say that information can be directly encoded into long-term memory. We don't need this intermediate step of storage in short-term memory. Okay, so when we ask how information gets into long-term memory it's a question about how information is encoded. So it's about encoding. And you may think, okay, one of the most prototypical things probably is rehearsal. And if you try to learn something, especially in school, you learn a foreign language, and when you're trying to learn vocabulary, it's often that you say the association uh, over and over again. So for instance, uh, English boat is in German boat. You may say boat, 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 and, and so forth to try to memorize that. However, um, it has been shown that the mere repetition of information keeps the information well in short-term memory. However, it does not as such result in transfer into long-term memory. So what I've just described is a, is a rather poor strategy or approach to memorize things for long-term storage. So, a study which has shown that rehearsal actually is not sufficient is the following. So what the authors, Glenberg and co-authors did was that they used a classical recall task, short-term memory recall task. So participants had to memorize numbers of four digits, in that, like this example, 4913. And they were allowed to rehearse the numbers in short-term memory, this verbal rehearsal. And they had different trials and in each trial they had a different length. So two seconds rehearsal, six seconds or 18 seconds. 
and after these two, six or eight seconds they were asked for uh, remembering or recalling that number. So they did that a couple of times over and over again. So and at the end of the session there came another memory trust which came at a surprise to the students or to the participants. So they didn't know that before. And they tested all 64 numbers of the whole session. So because this is now long ago from trying to memorize the numbers, this recall must come from long-term memory. And participants never intended to encode into long-term memory. So all the difference was the amount of rehearsal for the numbers. So what they have shown is that no matter how long you did the rehearsal here, memory performance did not differ. So it was the same whether you did for 18 seconds rehearse this number or for two seconds rehearse that number. It's the same probability that it gets into long-term memory. Okay, if it's not rehearsal, then of course the question arises what determines whether information is stored into long-term memory or not. So what, what might it be? And here is a very uh, interesting approach which has been uh, received a lot of support. It's a theory of depth of processing. So the idea is that the amount the stimuli have, pro have been processed determines the strength of the memory trace. We will see an example at the moment. So the idea is if you process something very deeply, it is well stored. If it's processed only on a very superficial level, then there's not very good long-term memory storage. And according to this theory, we have two types of rehearsal. One is maintenance rehearsal. It's this example, I give you my phone number and you just try to keep it in your memory until you have dialed it. So that's maintenance rehearsal. No intention to store it for a long time. Just keep it in short-term memory. And that's now interesting for that theory, a laborative rehearsal. Here we try to process the information in a deeper way, usually in a semantic way. And According to Craig and Lockhart, only the elaborative rehearsal results in storage, long-term memory storage, but not the maintenance rehearsal. Okay, so let's have a look at one of their key experiments they have done to support this theory. In this experiment, participants saw a word in each trial. For instance, the word book and they had to make a judgment regarding that word. And the judgments were of three different categories. It could be either a judgment on the vis visual feature. So for instance, does the word start with a capital letter? You don't have to process the word at all for this task. So it's a very shallow level of processing. The intermediate level of processing is the question about the phonological structure. So for instance, does the word book rhyme with look? So we have to process the sound, the phonology of the word. So it's an intermediate level. And finally, they are, had a task where you had to process the meaning of the word. So for instance, does the word book fit into this sentence? I'm going to read this. To decide that, I really have to think or analyze or process what a book is. I have to analyze the meaning. So in this task, it's the deepest level of processing. And at the participants just did that task. They had no idea that in the end of the session, they will be asked about all the words they had to work on in these trials. So it was an unexpected recognition task. And they've shown that deep level of processing resulted in best memory, better than intermediate level, which was better than shallow level. So that supports the idea, the deeper you process, the better you remember things. And that may sound familiar to you because a lot of people tell you if you want to memorize things, try to think about it, try to critically evaluate it. 
And the, one of the reasons for that is, except for of course training your critical thinking, is that you memorize it better. So if you want to learn something and you have it written in a book, this process of, for instance, writing your own script, summarizing what you have read, is a good strategy because for that you really have to think about what you have read, rephrase it in your own words. So you really have to process the meaning on a very deep level. And that results in good long-term memory storage. Another example is if um, I tell you my phone number and you just want to call me, you do this maintenance rehearsal. However, if you get a new mobile phone and you want to memorize your new number, usually what most people do is try to look at the number and see some system in there, for instance. Oh, there's a sequence of number. Oh, I knew that number from someplace else. So you really process this number then and work with that number to memorize it. <clears throat> Another implication from that study is that information seem, or verbal information seems to be stored in a semantic uh, representation in long-term memory. Because what they've shown that if you process the semantics, the meaning of the words, you have the best memory. If you remember from last week, short-term memory stores information phonologically. We had this acoustic confusion effect, the word length effect, so it's a phonological representation. So further support for this idea that information in long-term memory is stored semantically comes from this study. Here participants had to learn word lists and with the purpose of storing that for long-term memory storage. So you're given a list of 20 words and you're told five minutes later or something you have to recall that. And later they did a recognition test of the words. Recognition, if you remember, means that you get, if you learned 20 words, you may get 40 words, 20 which you have learned, 20 which you didn't learn. And you have to tell people, oh yeah, that was the word I learned before and that word I didn't learn or did see before. Now, what they manipulated were the non-targets the words they didn't learn, that didn't occur in the original list. And they could be either be completely dissimilar words or words which were phonologically similar to some of the learned words, so which just sound similar but have no relationship in meaning, or words which were semantically similar. So, for instance, synonyms. It may be a completely different sounding word, but the meaning is the same. And what they found is that only the semantically similar words cause confusion in the participants. So that if a semantically similar word, which they didn't learn, they often said, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Because they learned a word with a comparable meaning before. So that supports the idea that in our long-term memory we store information semantically. That means by meaning. <clears throat> Okay, so any questions on this initial concept of transferring information into long-term memory from short-term memory? Okay, so let's dive into the depth of long-term memory itself. So you may know a couple of movies like The Burn Identity, where the protagonist wakes up at some place, has lost all his memory. Can't remember, I think Jason Byrne was found in the sea, a couple of bullets in his body and didn't know who he was and anything like that. Kind of similar story, a little bit longer ago, not that popular that movie is, is this one. And they can't remember anything of their former lives. However, what they find out in the course of the movie is that they are capable of really good things like martial arts, using guns, speaking foreign languages and stuff like that. And these movies actually, in some respect, uh, give a good ref uh, representation of some features of long-term memory. 
For instance, that we have different subsystems. That it seems to be that our memory of actions and performance is separate to our factual memory, storage memory. So, it's an example of amnesia. That means a memory deficit. It's only roughly well shown because amnesia usually isn't complete. So in most of the cases you lose some of your memory, not like these actors, they lose everything and don't know their name and nothing from their past. However, they pretty accurately uh, describe these two types of memory. Memory for facts and episodes in our own life, which is called declarative memory, and which is lost for the people in the movies, and memory for doing things like martial arts, or speaking other languages, things like that, which is called procedural memory, and which is preserved in these people's uh, memories in the movies. <clears throat> So, amnesia, we won't go into that in detail because that's covered in uh, neuropsychology or biopsychology. Um, but just very broadly, uh, amnesia or patients suffering from amnesia are quite important for memory research because there are really many different types and they're caused by lesions to different brain areas. And it's always interesting to find patients which show a dissociation, which where one memory ability is preserved and another one is uh, impaired. Because that gives indication that it's actually two different systems if one is preserved and one doesn't work anymore. So one of the probably most famous cases is patient HM. It's one of the very first cases reported and due to a very severe uh, seizures they removed surgically part of the medial temporal lobes which are involved in memory. And what they found afterwards that HM was unable to store new information in long-term memory. He couldn't form new long-term memories. And these patients really suffer. They're extreme cases where uh, you, they don't remember meeting you and you can meet them every day for years and they always think you're a new person they never met before. However, HM was still able to keep information in short-term memory. So this was one of the first cases to show that actually long-term memory and short-term memory are really physiologically distinct systems which can be separately damaged. This only as an illustration with later research and more refined uh, analysis it has been shown that many more memory systems can be differentiated. So it turned out that long-term memory um, that we have different learning mechanisms we will speak about some of them today it's located in different brain areas depending on the exact store and we have different retrieval mechanisms to get the memories down. So long-term memory seems, seems to be really some very complex concept. It's not just one big store, one long-term memory and that's it. So um, we need a taxonomy or a system to describe that. And we will use one today which has been proposed by Squire in 2004. However, he of course didn't like invent that completely from scratch. It is based on the majority view uh, which is current in, in research. However, it's important to remember that this is only one view and certain aspects are uh, still disputed or under further investigation. Okay, so let's look how we can subdivide long-term memory. So we do that hierarchically. So this is like long-term memory overall. And one subcategory we have already seen from the uh, Burn movies for instance is that we seem to have a separate system for which is called declarative memory. And declarative memory can be further subdivided into semantics, so factual memory, like England is in Europe, 
and in episodic memory, which is about events from your personal experience. Yesterday I have been dining out at that and this place. This morning I spoke on the phone with my friend. This is episodic memory and this is factual memory. And both together are declarative memory. And on the other hand, we have non-declarative memory. And while this is kind of about conscious knowledge, this is more, uh, or also called explicit memory, this is more implicit memory. It's, for instance, uh, procedural memory. That means our skills and habits, knowing martial arts, knowing how to ride a bike. Then we have, on a very low level, we will speak briefly about that later, priming and perceptual learning. So, for instance, musicians become better at distinguishing notes in their instruments. We have classical conditioning as part of non-declarative learning, like in Pavlov's dog. And we have then non-associative learning, like sensitization and habituation. What well, we won't speak about, but just to complete that picture, this classical conditioning can be further subdivided into emotional responses and skeletal responses, but we won't go into that depth. And in today's session, we will go through all these different aspects, some very briefly, some the more relevant ones a little bit longer. And again, this is one way to view memory, it's a very broadly accepted view, but as I said, um, other people may term some boxes differently or may say, well, you can't so clearly differentiate between these two. There may be one thing and so forth. Okay, any questions on this introduction? Okay, so let's start with declarative memory overall before then going to semantic and episodic memory. So, declarative memory refers to knowledge, to general knowledge we have about facts. As I said, this example of England is in Europe and events. And this is called episodic memory. And the recall of information is conscious. So when we try to think of, okay, what is the capital of France, and we recall that information, then that it is Paris is a conscious thing which becomes aware to us. And because of that, it's also sometimes called explicit memory. The information we recall from long-term memory is transferred into short-term memory. So when we try to think of capital of France is Paris, then Paris, when it is recalled, is in our short-term memory. And we can work with that information. And for instance, try to retrieve further facts, use it as a recall cue, or compare it to other things, make decisions about that, how many letters has that word, and things like that. Okay, so as a very gener generic introduction to declarative now, semantic memory in more detail. So, it's general knowledge about the world we have in semantic memory. So, which are facts, can be meanings and concepts. So, it's not all very basic factual knowledge, but more abstract concepts as well. We will see examples in a moment. And facts are like the most basic units of semantic memory. It is, for instance, London is in England, London is the capital of the UK, things like that are very basic facts. And memory for such facts may actually be established immediately. So another fact may be my name or a name of a person you meet. And often if you know that this person, you will meet that person more frequently, it's enough to have one instance. They name their name once, and then you know it, and you don't forget it that easily. However, with experience, so for instance, children who learn, or even as adults, when we get into a new area where we don't have prior knowledge in, then more complex memory structures are formed, which help us in our everyday life to structure 
the environment to structure the memory contents. And these can be, for instance, concepts and schemas and scripts. Okay, so let's see, what's a concept? And a concept of something is a mental representation which is generic to something. So it describes a class of things in the world. To give you an example, we have a concept of a tree. And having this concept in mind, it's kind of having what is a prototypical tree, allows us to classify and identify new trees we have never seen before. We need this generic concept of a tree, otherwise we may come to a new tree we haven't seen and we think, oh, what is that? Is it a car or something? So we have these features at this general thing. <clears throat> These concepts allow us uh, to do higher level cognitive thinking and mental processes. This is an example for an abstract object, but the semantic memory includes concepts about abstract, abstract things as well. So for instance, our concept of what is freedom to us, that's stored here as well. Okay, a schema is a little bit more complex structure. It's related to the concepts. So it's a structure in memory that organizes categories of information, so for instance concepts, and the relationships among them. So it builds upon concepts, so the transition is, is fluent here between a concept and a schema. And a schema is said to consist of two parts. One is the core, and this is constant information which always have to be there for the schema to be fulfilled. And then slots, which is variable information. You will see an example which makes it clear. So we have a schema, what a room is. And the core information is that rooms have floors and ceilings. If there is no ceiling, we don't have a room. If there is no floor, we also have no room. However, the slots are, for instance, that rooms often have doors and windows. However, they may be variable in amount and position and size and so forth. So we have some core information and some variable information for the schema of a room. <clears throat> so, for example, when we ask the question, is that a room? Most people would say, yes, of course it is, because it has a ceiling, it has a floor, and even slightly untypical rooms with this screen or wall divider here in the middle doesn't disturb us, we recognize that as a room. <clears throat> However, is that a room? It's a little bit hard to tell. It looks like uh, we have here, uh, how's it called, stones at the bottom, and the lightning supposes there is no roof. However, what is if this is a very modern building with a glass roof and this is just some fancy concept of having this type of floor in there? Then Sunny would say, yeah, it's a room. It's not. So schemas help us to identify and structure the information we have from our surrounding and help us to identify things. And as you can see in that example, we when we get to a borderline situation, then we struggle a little bit and we have to further anal analyze the situation or need the explicit information, is there a roof or not, to decide that. Schemas are built on past experiences. So what we learned basically, it's, it's a learned concept. And schemas are really there for helping us to organize our perception and our memory structures. And there is an interesting or a bit funny study by Brewer and Trayens. And what they did is that they invited participants to um, take part in a study. And they told them initially, okay, please wait here. It was an office room before you can start the experiment. And actually the waiting in this office room was already part of the experiment. 
because in the next step they were led into the neighboring room to say okay now the experiment starts and then unexpectedly they were asked for items in the office they had been waiting before and they of course didn't know that they had to report that and what they found is that they often re or not often sometimes or frequently reported items having seen items which actually haven't been there but just fit the schema of an office so for instance books were reported to be there but there were no books in the office but they just nicely fit into an office you would expect some books in an office so for their recall for their structuring of the environment they use the schema they have in long-term memory <clears throat> okay a script then basically is a schema for sequences for actions of sequences so it's a sequence of expected behaviors for a given situation and it has the same purpose it helps us organize our behavior structure our behavior so it's a schema for sequences of events and scripts include default standards for who is involved, who are the actors in the situation, what props, what utilities do we have to use, what is the general setting of the whole situation, and what sequence of events. A traditional example is restaurant dining. So you have this traditional situation of going somewhere and having something to eat, and this schema, or uh, sorry, this script has a certain setting. It has to be at a place where you can eat. You don't get into that script when you are in surgery, for instance. You have your typical actors or roles of a customer, of a waiter. You have your typical props of table, food and money. And you all expect that as soon as you enter a restaurant, the whole thing is recalled from memory and put into the right order. You have a sequence. You expect when you enter the restaurant that you actually, depending on the restaurant, you might find your own table or you are led to a table and then you have to read the menu, you have to choose the dishes, then you call maybe the waiter and order something. So they help us understanding events so if something is missing, we know that something went wrong, for instance. They allow us to predict something. So the, uh, the restaurant dining example allows us to predict, okay, if I have been seated and given the menus, I know that soon the waiter will come to me and ask for my order. However, as I said before, these memory structures are based on learning. And that results in the typical confusion uh, if you, for instance, visit a foreign country and the scripts are different. So in other countries, you may actually have to call the waiter to give the order. In other countries, the waiter will always come by themselves. It would be impolite to actually call them and push them. Now I want to order now or something. And that's because it is culturally dependent and based on, on what you have learned. And these scripts let us automatically behave, therefore, appropriately. When we go into the library, we automatically are quiet, at least most of the people. <clears throat> so, to illustrate how they help us draw inferences, suppose this example from a study. John was feeling very hungry as he entered the restaurant. He settled himself at a table and noticed that the waiter was nearby. Suddenly, however, he realized that he'd forgotten his reading glasses. So what's the problem? Why is it, oh, suddenly I realized I forgot my reading glasses? Because we know he will get the menu in a moment and he will not be able to read it. There's no mentioning of that in the text, but our knowledge of the typical restaurant dining script allows us to make this inference. <coughs> So, with experience, for instance during learning in a child, more complex memory structures arise, as we said. So we have spoken about concepts, which are category, categories of things or ideas like trees, schemas, and so we organize 
these pieces of information and put them into a relationship with each other and scripts which are basically schemas for events for series of, of actions. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so we have spoken about the factual semantic memory, we are still in declarative memory, and now let's turn to episodic memory. Episodic memory is memory for events in our own life. So what we really experienced. So my episodic memory is completely different to your episodic memory. And a feature or characteristic of episodic memory is that we can situate it in time and space. So we know, okay, this memory is, it happened there at this time, two years ago in Switzerland when I was skiing or something. It's different to factual knowledge. The capital of France is Paris. You don't remember when you actually learned that. You just know it. A subclass of episodic memory is called autobiographical memory. And this is memory for, uh, which are very important in your personal life. So for instance, your first date, first kiss, uh, a birth of your child, an accident you had or something. And the difference here is, so suppose you, you go shopping and, and buy just some grocery stuff and go home, and nothing specific happened, then you would say this is episodic memory. However, if when you are at the cashier and want to pay your things, the shop is uh, robbed and you are held at gunpoint and it's really kind of a really impactful event for you, then this standard episodic memory may be considered to be an autobiographical memory because it suddenly is an important memory. A standard grocery shopping wouldn't be called autobiographical memory. Episodic memory has a certain set of characteristics. So as I said, we have a subjective sense of time. So we do kind of a mental time travel. Oh yes, back at these times. I remember, yeah. It has a strong connection to ourself, so like, oh yeah, I experienced at that time this and that, when I was on vacation or something. Often, the primary form of remembrance is visual images. So when you remember uh, your last skiing trip, then often immediately images of that trip pop up. Which is slightly, or which is somewhat different to the uh, semantic memory, where it's more the meaning of information. However, this, uh, besides these mainly visual images, we can have, let's say, a very holistic experience. So, especially in autobiographical memory of important events, we may also remember exactly time, place, the emotions we had, the smell, the taste. For instance, when you think about your first kiss, you may remember a lot of details about that situation. So, it's all coming together at one, at the same time. So, really, it's a holistic thing. However, generally, episodic memory is subject to rapid forgetting. And this is very easy or very easily demonstrated. You probably know what you had for breakfast this morning. But who can remember what you had for breakfast yesterday morning? Raise your hands, who can remember? Most people, yeah. Two days ago? Okay, get a few. Last week? Two weeks ago? I mean, unless you have like exactly the same thing every morning and you can just infer it, um, it's now about really can you recall it. And you will see that these, let's say, trivial events, they are rapidly forgotten. It's only the important events which are stored for a longer time. This is Endel Talving, and he's a very big name in memory research. And he actually coined the term episodic memory. And 
he made a distinction between two different things which according to Squire uh, are called slightly different today. So he would say um, we have a memory for knowing which we now would say it's a declarative memory, it's factual and semantic, and for remembering which is uh, the episodic memory, a feeling that is located in the past, so like that. <clears throat> there is one aspect in episodic memory which is quite important or has, is quite impactful and that is eyewitness testimony. And that is because in trials, uh, law trials at, at the court, eyewitness testimony is often used as evidence to say whether somebody is guilty or not of something, or to clarify how a situation exactly has been taken place. So we have to ask the question, how stable are such episodic memories of events? And one of the main researchers who started the research into that area is Elizabeth Loftus. And she did a series of experiments, and we will speak about some of them, where we ask, can such episodic memories be modified in a way? So maybe just by accident or by being inept and asking the right questions, or maybe on purpose to make the person say something um, which suits ourself. So one of the early studies she did was about car accidents. So participants viewed a short video clip of a car accident. And then they were asked what they saw. And like in the real situation, when you are under inquiry at the police or something, they posed some questions. However, what they varied was how exactly the questions were phrased. So they exchanged certain keywords, which they thought may have an impact on their, how they, what they report. So, for instance, <clears throat> they asked how fast were the cars when they smashed into each other. And this smashed into was replaced by altogether five or six different words. So another example was how fast were they when they hit each other. And what you can see is that the average estimate people give, they all have seen the same video clip. They only differ in how you, which word you use in the question, that they report different speed ratings. So that smashed into results on average in higher speed ratings than hit each other. And this can be up to 10 miles per hour, which makes a very crucial difference for, for instance, determining, based on eyewitness testimony, whether somebody has been too fast or not. So even so subtle differences in asking questions can bias the answers of eyewitnesses. Another example of the studies they did, um, again, a movie of a car accident is shown and the cars, no, none of the cars had any broken headlight. So they were all fine. And then later they asked people, some people they asked, have you seen the broken headlight? And another group of people were asked, have you seen a broken headlight? And as you may think, the broken headlight yielded more reports of a broken headlight than asking for a broken headlight. So again, a very small and minor modification of the way you phrase your question may change the answer of, of your eyewitnesses. <clears throat> yes? That's exactly the point. By asking, have you seen the broken headlight, you somewhat imply that there has been one. And people fall for that. So the retrieval of the memory is so inaccurate that you can bias the response. 
and it is a little bit, little bit tricky to find out what is the exact reason for that. Is it that they don't remember and just think, okay, they said the broken headlight, so probably there was one, so I will report, or whether using the word the just actually modifies their memory. And that's the next study where they try to really kind of induce something different. So what they did here was that they had a series of slides this time, uh, which then looked like a movie sequence, uh, where a car stopping at a junction then hit a pedestrian. And half of the participants saw the car stopping at a stop sign and the other half at a yield sign, which means it just give way and stop. So two different situations, otherwise identical. Now, the study is a little bit complicated to follow, but um, then the participants answered questions and they now modified again the questions. So, for instance, a question was, did another car pass the red dead soon, so this car which was standing there in this image before, while it was stopped at the, and now they modified, stop sign or yield sign. And they did that within every group. So the group who saw the stop sign, half of them saw at the stop sign, half of them saw at the yield sign, and the same for the yield group. So, the sign could be either consistent or inconsistent, what they had actually seen on the slide. Then, for 20 minutes, they did a completely irrelevant irre task to just let this information settle, pass away. So, at this point, it's important to realize that the question had nothing to do with the sign. It was just a side information. It was, the question was about whether another car passed here or not while stopped at the sign. And then later on, they did a forced choice recognition test where they have shown the two images which I've just shown. One with a stop sign, one with a yield sign. And they asked, okay, which one have you seen before? And what they shown is that there was a tendency for the people who had actually seen the stop sign but then had here the yield sign tended to choose the yield sign picture more often. So even in such a recognition task where you have the visual images and you could say okay that's somewhat a visual memory and where you have a really sub-threshold as a side aspect that influences your um, your memory. So because it was a little bit complicated, once more uh, illustrated the task. So example of one condition, you see a car stopping at a stop sign, then you get the question, uh, what about this, whether a car passed when you parked at a yield sign? You do some other task and then you're asked, what picture did you see before? And then people actually tend to choose the yield sign. Of course, it's not like suddenly all people choose the other picture. The effects are subtle, they are not huge. But of course, in an individual case, it may be very relevant if you flipped one memory just by an inappropriate question. Of course, because of the importance, there has been a lot of research into this eyewitness testimony things. And it has been shown that memory can be kind of altered. And new false memories can actually be implemented. And in the textbook, in the Gobe textbook, you will see examples where people have been convinced that they took air balloon rides when they were a child, although they never did that, or were lost in a shopping mall or something like that. I'm not an expert in this area, I have to say. And the examples I've seen so far were all I was wondering about events where you really implemented a completely new memory were about childhood events where our memory becomes thin. I'm personally wondering whether it would work with adulthood events as well 
whether you could implement a memory that three years ago you went on to a skiing trip to Switzerland. I don't think that would work actually. So that's a little bit to keep in mind that it's maybe not as dramatic as it's shown sometimes here. Another question which is of course important is these are laboratory studies. What about real life situations? So there of course is a limited amount of research on that because in real life we can't that easily manipulate things. Um, however for instance one study which has been done was that the researchers uh, approached uh, people who witnesses who actually were involved in a shop robbery and the shop owner killed the robber. So it was a very intense memory for these people, so definitely autobiographical memory and probably very impactful event. And what they found is that even several months later the witnesses present had rather accurate memories. So they are not very susceptible, so when you have these very severe events. So there seems to be some limit to how much you can do to memories. However, um, this was an incident. If you think about eyewitness pedestrians walking by when there was a not very serious car accident, you may be much closer to the laboratory situation as worked on with by Elizabeth Loftus, where it becomes more relevant. So, as a rough conclusion, we probably can draw that um, normal memories are somewhat fragile and may be distorted by improper questioning, for instance. However, that very emotionally loaded memories are less sensitive to manipulations. <clears throat> okay, do we have any questions on the episodic memory part. Okay, then let's have, a little, let's have a little break before we go on. Okay, let's go on. Let's turn on a different aspect which we didn't speak about so far and that is <clears throat> we spoke now about declarative with semantic and episodic memory and if you put that along the time axis and let's say we are right here now, this is the present, then the memories we have spoken about are in the past. So it's called retrospective memory. There's also a memory for the future, which is called prospective memory. So it's, you might say, remember something to remember at some point. Let's speak about that for a moment. So some consider it to be part of declarative memory because it's also conscious. However, some would say, well, it's two different things to speak about. One is declarative and non-declarative, and the other one is retrospective and prospective. They are kind of independent from each other. And prospective memory in general is our ability to set up our mind to remember something in the future. And that is kind of a memory thing as well. So something like, I will call you tomorrow, or next time I'm at Brunel, I will return the book. There are two different types. One is uh, the event-based prospective memory, so that the event in the future is triggered 
uh, or the action in the future is triggered by an event. So if I'm in the library, I will return the book. Or next time I'm in that particular store, I will buy that item. Or next time I go to Pizza Express, I'll eat a margarita or something along those lines. So we don't know yet when it will happen, but it's triggered by a certain event. The other thing is a time-based uh, prospective memory, so that an actual time triggers the action. Something like, I will call you at 4 p.m. this or tomorrow afternoon, or I must remember to watch this TV show tomorrow at 8 p.m. Something like that. So we really need to set a specific time to that. <clears throat> so prospective and retrospective memory um, is a little bit unclear uh, what the underlying mechanisms are. So it may be underpinned by similar mechanisms, but the evidence overall is mixed. So when you again look at patients which have certain brain lesions, then you find some patients where both is impaired at the same time, which suggests that it's somewhat comparable mechanisms. <coughs> Sorry. But you also find patients where you find, can observe a certain distinction between the two systems. Okay, any questions about this brief bit on prospective memory? Okay. Let's stay f still with, uh, so this is retrospective memory and we have seen prospective memory. Let's stay now again with declarative memory for a moment and speak about forgetting in that area. And before turning to forgetting in long-term memory, let's go back to last week's topic, topic forgetting in short-term memory. And suppose we have such a standard recall task uh, where we see, uh, for instance, such trigrams X, A, J, uh, which are presented, which are non-words. And when we prevent rehearsal of that, for instance, by counting backwards directly after the items have been seen, then we can see how long the memory traces uh, stay in short-term memory. So, in this particular study, the duration of the backwards counting varied between 3 and 18 seconds. So, you are not able to rehearse during that time at all. So, information probably will be lost. And then later on, you do a free recall task. And then you can plot the performance. So, how many percentage, this is 80%, this is 100%, are remembered after how many seconds. And you see after 18 seconds virtually everything is gone from short-term memory. One interesting feature is, which has been replicated many many times, that forgetting follows a so-called power function. So initially you have a higher rate of forgetting which then fades out and slows down. And this is a very typical finding. And the time domain of short-term memory is around 18 seconds. There are two theories why forgetting in short-term memory occurs. One is that information just fades away if it's not refreshed by rehearsal. That's the decay theory. It just decays. A second theory is the interference theory. And this states that information actually does not fade away, but interferes with old or new information. So it somewhat gets some mixed up and intermingled with our current always ongoing stream of information which comes to us. And there are two types of interference. One is proactive interference and that means that when we want to try to learn something it is a bit more difficult because we previously have learned something. And I think it's 
best illustrated or understood if you think about these experiments where you have to learn word lists. And when you think about that in such studies, you not only have to learn one word list, but often 10 or 15 lists, then at some point, let's say after the sixth or seventh list, you may just say, oh, it's so hard to remember this new list because all the old lists are interfering with, with what I have to learn right now. That would be proactive interference. Retroactive interference is that when you learn a new list, let's say your fifth or sixth list, that it becomes increasingly harder to remember what you have learned in your first list because you get so much inf new information which just interferes and kind of overrides and mixes up with the old information which you learned. So retroactive interference means I'm learning something right now and that kind of destroys my old memory. And as we have seen before already, interference seems in this case mainly come from semantic similarity. So when you learn a list of numbers and then a list of letters, that does interfere much less strongly with each other as compared when you have to learn two lists of synonyms and then you have to recall the lists separately. Okay, so this is the basic idea of forgetting in short-term memory. Either information decays, just fades away, or just interferes with new information. Now let's turn to forgetting in long-term memory. And of course the first question is, are the same mechanisms at work here as well? So it's also decay or interference, and the answer is no. So forgetting in long-term memory is due to other mechanisms as compared to short-term memories, two distinct systems. So the question arises, why do we forget at all in long-term memory? And forgetting is normal. So it's, as we just already had this example, which, with uh, what you had for breakfast the last couple of weeks, you see, well, you actually do forget most of the information. So, and also a lot of information in our environment. You probably have heard loads of names of people you have never met again, so you forgot them. And you have learned a lot of facts in school, and you may have forgotten a lot of that as well. <clears throat> so, in a way, forgetting is totally normal. And also, forgetting is useful because it reduces the demands of our memory system. And what information should we remember and retain? That's basically the information which is probably useful for our future, for our future actions, behavior, future decisions we have to do. So all the information which our memory system thinks is not useful for the future should be dismissed, should be forgotten. Let's return. This is a more basal mechanism, more non-declarative, not the one we speak about, but you forget virtually every meal you had. So when you think about your lifetime, there are probably very few meals you actually can remember. However, if you had a meal and you became sick afterwards, you may have had uh, food poisoning or something, then this single instance leaves a very strong trace and often you some or it may be so strong that you can't eat that particular food for years again. So because in this case from a uh, perspective of our biology it's very important to avoid that food for our future decisions because it may be poisonous or something. So our memory system tries to decide what information is useful and what isn't. Like with names, if you already know you will meet this person never again in your whole life, you probably will forget about the name. However, if you know uh, with that person you will go on a date tomorrow, you hopefully will remember that name and it's very likely that you do. <clears throat> 
There are two explanations for a forgetting in long-term memory. One is that the information is actually still in memory, but we just can't access it anymore. So we've seen an example for that in a moment. The other explanation is that information is actually deleted from memory, removed from memory. So let's have a look at this inability, inability to access information. And to access contents of long-term memory, we need retrieval cues, which act like an index. So suppose you have an encyclopedia where all entries are totally random and you lose the index. It's virtually impossible to find any information in that encyclopedia. And these retrieval cues are like an index to such a book. So let's have an example of that. What memory comes up or will you access probably if you get the following cues? I'm speaking about a mouse. It's a smart mouse. It's cute, at least considered by most people. It came by Walt Disney, it was created. So most people will probably have retrieved the memory of Mickey Mouse. However, what if for some reason some retrieval cues are deleted? You don't know it's a mouse, you don't know it's smart. You just have as a cue, oh, it's a cute Disney figure. There are so many things you can think of that not necessarily you are able to retrieve Mickey Mouse. But of course it's in your long-term memory still. However, if we get other cues, then we still maybe access it, it again. So when we say Minnie Mouse, Pluto, Goofy, then suddenly we get back to Mickey Mouse, even if we don't have these two cues. And that's actually something when you re observe the interaction between people, conversations, then often um, conservate, con yeah. uh, you can see that people try that out in real life. So for instance, think about this hypothetical uh, dialogue between two people. Uh, like, have you heard the news about Matt Damon? Um, who's that? Oh, you know him for sure. He's blonde, good-looking, about 45 years old, and he's a good friend of Ben Affleck. So the other person now tries to provide retrieval cues. He says, oh, no idea what you're talking about. The one who played in the Bourne movies. Oh, that's Matt Damon. Now there's a retrieval cue the person can actually use. And now he can retrieve that. So the memory of Matt Damon is in this person's memory, but the cues, retrieval cues, were not appropriate. So you can go along that line. <coughs> Okay, an alternative explanation is that memory traces are actually deleted from memory. So, if we don't use it, our memory system may say at some point, okay, we seem to not need that, so we can get rid of that. However, the memory traces, it seems that they are not deleted like in an all in all or nothing fashion, like, okay, now we don't need it, it's removed now, like in a computer, but they kind of um, fade away more. So there's even a paradigm which is directed or intentional forgetting, where you actually can try to forget information and you actually really have lower memory for that later on. Instead they slowly fade away. And then is the question, what's the time course of this fading? And there's a study by Barik and colleagues who asked uh, quite a few uh, alumni from university who graduated long ago, up to 54 years ago, some more recently, about their grades, graduation grades. And that's an information which you probably never used again, really, except for typing your resume maybe to apply for jobs, but only maybe in the one, first one or two years after graduation. So what happens here? And this is the data they've shown, and we only want to look at this solid curve here. This is the correct recall. And you may see that the shape looks somewhat familiar. So like in short-term memory, it again follows a power function, where we have 
rather rapid forgetting initially and then it slows down the forgetting. However, the time scale is very different. In short-term memory this was 18 seconds. In long-term memory we are at 50 years here. Of course, the exact time frame depends on a number of factors, like the importance of the memory and things like that. So, it may be different for other things, but it's clearly different to short-term memory. And it always follows a power function. Okay, any questions regarding the forgetting aspect? Okay, then let's turn to non-declarative memory and we will go through that much quicker as compared to the declarative memory. Okay, so non-declarative memory in general overall, a brief introduction. It, the term refers to a wide range of different modalities actually. So it ranges from classical conditioning like Pavlos dog to like expert performance like playing some musical instrument and the retrieval is non-conscious so when you think about uh, when you have to ride a bike you really are not conscious of okay now I have to slightly sway to the left to keep balance I now have to lift my right leg to get the pedal up and then press it down that's all unconscious so therefore it's sometimes called implicit memory so declarative explicit versus non-declarative implicit memory is as an example explicit memory is that you remember a certain driving lesson in because you had an incident or something like that and the implicit memory is that you have improved driving skills as the result of that lesson so that you're a better driver so that's a distinction between and this is an example of procedural memory so non-declarative memory has also some specific characteristics and the, one of the main ones is that it always refers to actions and performance so non-declarative memory never refers to facts or something. The retrieval of the memory is basically automatic. So it puts, imposes low demands on our cognitive system, like riding a bike. Once you learned it, it doesn't require your attention. The retrieved information, as I illustrated just, is not stored in short-term memory. It doesn't fill that like riding a bike. However, like the distinction we had on the lecture on, on, on attention, because it's automatic, a drawback is that we can't control that. When we ride a bike, we ride in autopilot, kind of automatically. Of course we can steer, but the majority of actions we perform are fully automatic. and We have little control over that. So these actions or these memories are inflexible. If we want to relearn, we really have to relearn. It's not like factual knowledge. By some reason you learned that, I don't know, Toulouse is the capital of France, then you say, oh no, it's Paris. It can be one instance and you corrected that memory. Let's have a look at some of the non-declarative ones and the procedural memory is probably the most important one at least for us as psychologists and procedural memory is basically in how-to memory it's a memory for performing certain types of actions it's learning how to cycle or knowing how to cycle it's swimming uh, tying shoelaces these things were initially you really need a lot of attention and how to learn that and you become better by practice. How do we acquire it? As I just said, by practice. That means we repeat the activity over and over again, get feedback and try to improve that. And this learning is often, um, or the process of learning is unconscious. Although we try to consciously do the movement 
that our movement improves is actually an unconscious process. Because it's just that each practice refines the motor programs. So, um, how is it acquired? Again, the learning rate is high in the beginning. If we look at these learning cu curves, then the rate slows down until reaching a plateau. So, this is again expressed by a power function. So, it looks like that. You, initially, you have a high rate of learning and then it slows down. And uh, this is called the power law of learning and it's very universal again. This is an example taken from learning a complex typing task where people were invited into the laboratory and then had sessions of learning that and you see there up to 20 sessions they do this uh, and, and you can describe that. Can you influence the speed of learning by different types of learning? How, for instance, you distribute your practice of the task. And this has been investigated by Alan Badley, the one we had last week who proposed the short-term memory or well, working memory model. And um, they used an applied setting where postal workers here in the UK in the late 70s uh, were introduced to a new system uh, of a letter so how to sort letters. And they had to type in the postcode on a keyboard and before that they had a different system. So what they did was that they put the postal workers into different training or learning groups and observed how they learned. And they had four different groups. One group was trained one session per day and each session for, was for one hour. So they actually learned, trained for one hour a day. Then they had a group which had two sessions per day, each for one hour. So overall they had two hours per day. They had another group which also had two hours per day, but not in two separate sessions, but in one long two-hour session. And finally they had a group which had spent four hours a day by having two sessions, each lasting two hours. So it's a distinction between having the practice very distributed across time and very messed or condensed or compressed in time. And then they looked at the performance when they all had an equal amount of training with respect to how many hours they spent training, so 60 hours. So when they looked at the performance uh, the different groups actually spend different amount of days in training because when you look exactly after 60 hours for group one it was after 60 days and for this group it was already after 15 days but they spend four hours a day and they spend one hour a day. Okay, this, these are the results and as I said they had to type in the postcode on a keyboard and this is the rate correct keystrokes per minute. So the higher the better the performance. And this is the hours of practice. And we look at this point in time where they had roughly around 60 hours practice. This group were one hour per day. So they were tested after 60 days and they showed actually the best performance. And at this point, they all had the same amount of practice with respect to hours spent in practice. Then we have these two groups. They were tested after 30 days. They had two hours per day. One group had two sessions of each one hour. And this is the group which shows a slightly better performance as this group, which had one long session of one hour per day. And they are comparable in that they are tested both after 30 days. And finally, the group with the lowest performance, it was tested after 15 days, and they had four hour per day practice. Now what you have to keep in mind, if you test them all after 60 days, so somewhere here, then this group of course is 
much better. So they would be further <laughs> beyond here even um, because they would have many, many hours of practice. So what's the reason for that finding? And one explanation is that procedural memory in particular probably needs phases of what is, has been termed consolidation. That means we learn something and then it's a good idea to leave it aside before we do the next practice. And this may happen, for instance, during sleep. And the most likely explanation is that after the practice there are ongoing changes in our neurons and probably synapses or most likely synapses which consolidate the learning experience. So if we learn slow, if we have the time and learn slowly, then we are actually most effective because we give it time to consolidate. And that's often an experience people have as well. If you train something, for instance, learning to play tennis or whatever activity you may have learned as an adult, and you had a session with a teacher, often you will find that, in particular, at the end of the session, your concentration is down and you really don't perform very well anymore. Then you go home and you go back through the next training session and you will realize that you actually start on a higher level than, last, than, you, than you stopped last session. <clears throat> so, training in this type of study was unavoidably confounded with the number of different days spent in training. So, if you spend four hours per day, but also for 60 days, you would probably be better than a person who just trained one hour for 60 days. <clears throat> However, then you get another confound that this group overall spent 240 hours of training as compared to 60, training, 60 hours of training. <clears throat> okay, I said that already. So, as, as a conclusion drawn from that study, you can say that distributed practice seems really superior to massed practice. So, if you have the time, then make it distributed is more effective. So, try to remember that when you learn for exams as well. This example was from procedural memory, but of course there is a certain transfer to uh, declarative memory as well. So, starting early and doing only small bits and pieces is usually more effective than, you know, have the last three or four days and then try to cram it all in. However, um, starting early, of course, requires some discipline uh, from the student's side. Okay, any questions on the procedural memory? Okay, then let's quickly go through the rest which we have here. And let's start with perceptual priming, and that's a very low level learning which happens here. And it's comparable to the procedural learning. A lot of the memories, so to say, of the procedures we learned are actually stored in our motor systems. So when we learn how to swim, then this memory, so to say, is in our premotor and primary motor cortex by new connections and the ways the neurons store that. And perceptual learning happens in rather low-level perceptual areas of the brain by fine-tuning how the neurons work. And perceptual learning is, for instance, that if we need that a lot, we can improve our discrimination abilities. For instance, discriminating musical tones in musicians or perceptual things in the visual system. An example is reading that we can really get trained to discriminate letters from each other. And one example which illustrates that it's extremely low level is perceptual learning. You can train people to distinguish the exact orientation of a line. And if you ask them 
to always fixate on a certain point on the screen and if you remember the primary visual cortex is organized in a, in a retinotopic way then this stimulus will always be worked on in the primary visual cortex by the same neurons but not by other neurons. So you learn an increased discrimination ability and then after you've learned that you do the exactly same task at a different point in visual space and you will see that you lose some of the discrimination you've learned. So it's even in the primary visual cortex in V1 that you can find your neurons and so to say learning takes place. Another example is classical conditioning which is long-term memory learning and you probably heard that a few times so we go that through that very quickly. Initially before the conditioning you have an un so-called unconditioned stimulus like food which results in a response in this dog and the response is salivation because he's happy to get the food in a moment. So it's an unconditioned response. Before conditioned, you have a neutral stimulus. If you ring a bell, you don't get any response, no salivation. Then you pair the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus and you get an unconditioned response, the salivation again. For this conditioning to work, the timing is extremely crucial you have to ring the bell somewhat before you present the food. If you do it only slightly after the food, it has no association with the bell at all. Conditioning only works when this stimulus has predictive value. <clears throat> and then after conditioning you have the conditioned stimulus which then the bell actually can elicit the response of salivation. So the dog learned in this example that the bell means food. It's an association, associative learning. So it illustrates that the dog knows a bell and it knows food. And it illustrates that two elements can be linked. That the elements which are stored suddenly can, one can become predictive of the occurrence of the other one. And this comes because of the temporal contiguity here. I think two last slides. A non-associative form of learning is habituation. And habituation means that when we get a harmless stimulation and we get it repetitively, then our response to that fades away. So. Um, Suppose you want to read a book and suddenly noise is starting. You may be distracted initially, but after some while you may get used to the noise and you actually can concentrate. So that's habituation. That of course works only if the stimulus is harmless. So if I always do like that, you will get habituated to that. If instead I always slap you in the face, there probably won't be habituation to that. <clears throat> the opposite effect is sensitation. So if there is a meaningful stimulation, you may get more sensitive, so your behavior is magnified. And you may know that, for instance, if friends of you wanted to play a trick on you and really scared you, for instance, uh, by putting up a monster's cons costume, sneaking into your room at night and then suddenly do that. And afterwards you may be much more sensitive to other stimuli as well. Maybe a click and you go like that also. Or you know that uh, when you watch, watch movies, scary movies, that they work in a way that they build up the tension so you get more and more sens uh, sensitized, what's the word, sensitive to that. Okay, any questions on all this remaining rest bit? Okay, so I think I don't need to really summarize that. We have seen this declarative and non-declarative, that's really two different memory systems represented in different brain areas and they can be further subdivided 
and please again remember this is one taxonomy it's widely agreed on the basic structure is usually the same but other people may term that differently and so forth but just keep that in mind okay then thanks for coming and next week we start with language language will actually be two full sessions and we have this first session next week okay see you next week